So, um, guys, welcome to uh, session 12 of the Sprint Coach Mentoring Program. So, tonight's workshop, Transitioning Under 20 Athletes to the Next Level with Anja, Tanya Buford Bailey. Uh, this is the first of six workshops scheduled as part of the program, which resume, resumes tonight after difficult um, 2020 and cuts to the program budget. Um, I welcome selected mentoring program coaches, national relay program coaches, and coaches of selected national relay squad athletes. I also welcome associates of the AI high performance team and Jackie Fran, our performance pathway manager. Um, I would especially like to welcome Tanya. Um, Tanya's competitive and coaching record uh, speaks for itself. Um, a successful career as an athlete at collegiate and international senior level. Um, winning world and Olympic medals in the 400 meter hurdles. Um, she is currently one of the top coaches in the US with major success at collegiate and international level. Um, in this regard, um, in, in regard to tonight's workshop, it's important to note she has guided athletes um, up to under 20 um, international level um, with global success and then on through to senior level uh, international Olympic success um, at World Indoors, World Outdoors, Olympic Games. Um, she was recommended to me by Dan Paff. I went to Dan, um, who, who's presenting um, next month, um, for a suggestion of, of a successful female female coach, as some of some of the coaches had expressed an interest to hear from some female coaches. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was good good to get that recommendation. Um, just a few things for tonight. I'll ask everyone to put their mics on, on mute if possible. Um, Tanya, Tanya's presentation will last approximately one hour. Then we'll open up for questions. So if you have any questions, please take notes and if possible, keep to, till the end. Um, Tanya, uh, directly after this, is heading to a meet in Arkansas with, with, her, with her athletes. Um, so she's going to, going to be, going to be on, on the road straight after this. Um, I believe a, a, an eight-hour drive. Um, usually she would fly, but that's not possible at the, at the moment. Um, Tanya, Tanya has told me her, her link to Ireland goes back as far as uh, competing against Susan Smith in the foreign hurdles in the, in the mid to the late 90s. And uh, she's been introduced to YouTube clips of RT TV um, of, of Bill O'Hurley and, and so on, interviewing and talking about uh, Susan Smith's achievements, which was quite a surprise to Anya that uh, there was big emphasis put on on uh, performances at Olympics and world champions and so on. Um, so, without any further ado, I hand over to to uh, Tanya. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It is absolutely a pleasure to be able to um, join with you guys today. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, myself and just give you a, a little bit of a background first before we go into the, um, the main topic. So um, as Daniel said, um, I am a longtime trackster. I um, have no shame in saying I'm 50 years old now. I know a, a lot of women don't like to put that out there, but me, I'm very happy and proud to be able to make 50. Um, I started running track when I was eight years old in a club program where, um, you know, from all ages up from six years old, all the way up to 18. So uh, my background um, was mainly uh, very, very deeply rooted in, into youth sports, which is eventually what I wanted to always do and will eventually do. Right now I have a track club that I started in 2019, thinking that 2020 was gonna be the greatest year ever, but <laughs> that didn't happen. But, uh, but it was great. I, I was really happy and proud to be able to start this track club. And eventually I, I want to translate this uh, club to youth once I'm done working on the elite level. Um, and then that's something I feel like I can go into retirement doing because I, I love working with the young ones. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. That is the home of Edwin Moses. If any of you guys are familiar with Edwin Moses, it was one of my motivations for starting to run 400 hurdles. Um, and uh, just having someone from your area who was doing so great at the time that, um, you know, was a great motivation to, um, to start hurdling. 
um, got a, a college scholarship to the University of Illinois, um, uh, raised by a single mother of uh, seven children. Uh, I have a sister who passed away uh, two years ago from mus muscular dystrophy, but she was one of the, uh, my motivations, my entire track career uh, was um, seeing her in her condition. And, and, and here I am uh, born a year later and have all this outstanding uh, athletic and muscular ability. And here she is and she can't even, you know, brush her own teeth, you know? So for me, uh, it was something that really kept me motivated my entire life. Um, and so every opportunity that I felt like I could get on a track and, and do something special, even in a training session, that was really important to me. Um, and that's one of the things we'll talk about too, is, is how this transition works. And it mainly works by um, self-motivation. You have to have something constantly motivating you on a day-to-day -day basis or else um, it, it's going to be pretty tough. Um, I competed in three Olympics. They were all so very different. Uh, the first Olympics I was in college, I was the youngest person on the team. Um, and you go from kind of this nobody running track to the next thing you know, you're taking um, a team picture with Carl Lewis and Jackie Joyner Kersey and, and these people wondering how in the world you fit in. Um, that was back in 1992 in Barcelona. Um, the next Olympics was in 96, that was in Atlanta here at home. And, and that's where, um, when I was competing against Susan Smith and, and, and being introduced to um, the sport from a totally different vantage point, going into the games as a favorite and, and someone who could get a medal. Um, I did get a bronze in, in that race. I was super, super, super disappointed when I crossed the finish line um, until, you know, a couple seconds later, it, it, you, you start to think like, there's only three people in the world that's going to get one of these. So it, it took a second for me to, you know, get myself back to reality. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a part of, of the sport too. Um, and then the next year in, in Gothenburg with um, Kim Batten going under the world record, which was very fun. And, and I think one of um, uh, my most exciting experiences as a track runner and just being able to, um, uh, being able to always have that as something that's really special in the sport. Um, then, uh, you know, going on to making the 2000 Olympic team. And that one was really different because um, I had a son along the way, put my career on hold. Um, we'll discuss that a little bit too, and how those kind of things uh, get in, uh, in the fold of being a professional athlete for females. Um, but I did um, end up making an Olympic team when he was about a year and a half old. Um, and so that was actually really totally different from going to this first Olympics, going as a college kid to the last one, being a mother and, and being one of the elders uh, on the team. So that was, uh, it was really cool, excuse me. It was really cool to be able to have all those different experiences from different vantage points in my life. Uh, in college, I got a degree in elementary education. So my goal as a young person was always to be a teacher, which I think works so well for what I do now, because I feel like it's just coaching is te teaching, right? Because you have to be teaching on a daily basis. So I got my degree in elementary education. I was teaching fourth grade for a little while until my college coach, who was very, very good, great friends with Dan Path, um, said, why don't you, why don't you come and help me coach. And I was always doing stuff with youth and always doing uh, volunteer coaching on the collegiate level. And I was like, hey, I said, you do know I have two little kids. Cause at this point I had two little kids at the time. And he, and, and he said, um, you know, it's funny. I had to ask that question. Wait, I'm going to be coaching and running around all the world with these two little babies. And um, because head coach was my coach who uh, uh, took me through my whole career was like, hey, I, I'm going to make it work for you. And, I mean, my kids were at every track meet. Uh, they learned to ride their bikes on the track. Uh, <laughs> I started making my daughter, and I mean making her, run last year. And um, she threw the shot put, and she ran the hurdles. And I was like, how do you know how to do this stuff? And she's like, Mom, I've been watching it my whole life. I'm like, oh, okay. So uh, you, you have been paying attention. Um, so um, started out as an, as an assistant coach. Really took the first couple years to learn, 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 learn. Uh, they used to call me. 
the clipboard girl because I'd walk around with a clipboard all the time, just writing down notes, writing down notes. Um, then I became an associate head coach and then a head coach. Um, so really worked my uh, way up the ranks and, um, and, uh, and now a professional coach. I really do enjoy. I don't have to recruit. That's probably the only thing that I think is different. And the, uh, the athletes that I coach are a little bit older. But, um, but other than that, it, it, it feels exactly the same. Um, I do uh, believe one of my uh, big, biggest accomplishments as a coach was in 2016. Um, I was uh, uh, USA Coach of the Year. And, um, and that, so that was pretty big. I had um, five young athletes. Every single one of my athletes at the games were under the age of uh, 21. And they all got medals. Every single person that went to the games got a medal. And so, um, so that was really, really big for me as a coach. And um, uh, right now I have in my track club, seven athletes. Uh, some of them you might know, some you may not. I mean, Morlakea Kennison is, is a short sprinter. Ashley Spencer got a, um, a medal in um, Rio in the 400 hurdles. Uh, Thomas is an, is an up and coming star. She's run 22 1 in the 200. She's a collegiate from Harvard. Um, another young lady who went to San Diego State, who is um, she's a 22 4 girl and run, has run 10 9, also in the 100. Morlakea Kennison's run 10 9. Um, I have a 49 7 400 uh, young lady. And right now I'm just coaching women, I don't have any guys in my group right now. I'm sure that will change, um, but I coached a lot of male athletes when I was in the college program. And then in the professional, um, uh, I had a kid that was, actually he ran with um, Thomas Barr in Rio in the 400 hurdles, but he was actually a college athlete at the time. <laughs> um, so very young. I mean, I'm telling you when in Rio, all of my athletes were, were very, very young. And um, so um, I think that's pretty much, much it about me. Um, I have uh, checked into Athletics Ireland and, and see you guys are really doing some, starting to do some really great things in the sprints. Um, I, I watched some video of her. She's a, she's a little sprint queen. So I love kind of um, seeing how that's transitioning, your, your 200 guy. So I think um, things are really coming along there. And um, I, I will tell you, my favorite Ireland athlete is Sonia Sullivan, which I'm sure you're not surprised because... We were actually kind of at the same time, so. <laughs> but um, do you uh, do you want to just go into Daniel? Okay. Yep, please. Yep. Let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, we'll go ahead and move forward, and um, I'm going to try to stay on this topic of transitioning, but at the same time, um, I think it will relate to um, any level at this point. But um, we'll we'll try to focus on this transition. Um, now, so we uh, talked a little bit, well, there's the intro, but um, I really wanted to talk a little bit about um, my philosophy as a coach. So um, the, the personal relationships are super, super important, okay? Especially at this level, because you don't have a lot of people around you. There's not these groups of, when I was coaching college track, there was probably 20, 30 athletes in one group at time at one time um, that I was coaching and now it's, it's much more um, narrowed down to having uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one time with athletes. I think that's very important and also very important to know as a coach what your athlete's weaknesses are and focusing on that, okay? Um, usually when they get to this level, they're all super talented. They all have the gift. They were born with the genes and now you have to try to um, dig things out of them that they don't even know that they have, okay? And they can't continue to just skate on ability. And a lot of the youth athletes that are very talented have done that their whole lives. I mean, they know when they're two and three years old that they have something different than them. I actually suffered through that for, in my uh, youth as an athlete. As I was, um, it was so easy to beat and so easy uh even in training that it, when it got to the level that I needed to take it up another notch, it took me a while to figure it out, you know, and it was really my coach, you know, kind of beating it into me that this is something that I needed to understand. 
and that I couldn't continue to just rely on ability because then it just starts to catch up with you and every, you know, the abilities, everybody's got it the, the closer you get to the top. So I think that's one of the, um, the biggest things that I try to uh, get my athletes that I coach to understand, especially when they have been um, excellent youth athletes. Um, those are the topics that we'll talk about. I'll just keep going here. Okay, so one of the, big, the biggest things of determining why do you want to do this? You know, you get to the point where things are going well, you're beating people, you're, you're, you're competing at you, these youth uh, high level youth championships and, and under 20s. And why do you want, what is your motivation for taking this to the next level? That is hugely important because as I said before, it's all about staying today. You can train for months and months and months before you ever have a track meet. I mean, look at what happened to us last year. We, we were literally just training with, you know, a black hole, not knowing what was going is really important to know why you're doing this and what your goals are. Um, youngsters to competing against grown men and women who have bills to pay and, um, and a lifestyle to maintain. So, you know, it just, it change uh, the why. It's not, it's not fun. It's not just for fun anymore. Okay. There's definitely in, intrinsic motivations, but it's just, it's not fun. You, you, this is a job and you have to look of it, look at it as a job. And um, being at the next level takes a lot of responsibility. Um, I mentioned anti-doping responsibilities because that's one thing that I noticed with my young athletes that transition to the, pr the pros is they didn't take that responsibility um, they didn't take it as seriously as they could have. And, and I'll tell you, one of my athletes actually had a, um, a few missed tests. You know, you, when you see these things, you go, how in the world can someone miss a drug test? You know, you got to do this and you got, and if, if there isn't somebody holding their hand, it is very possible for it to happen. Not taking responsibility as a professional now and this being your job, okay? Um, and uh, that was one of the things I even actually had to reach out to USA Track and Field about is that they have to do a better job of getting the athletes that have come through the collegiate system and the youth program to understanding uh, this anti-doping because, you know, the AIU does not play around. And they'll, they'll send you out one or two uh, emails and everything else you have to do on your own, and if and they're not going to keep reminding you, uh, and catch you slipping, you're in trouble. Um, and then also having this really great support system that uh, understands what your goals are and are going to be there with you every step of the way, because that's the I also see that gets in the way is the support system, and if it's not strong, and everybody isn't on board that you've let into your circle. Those are the people that will end up bringing you down. Um, so again, we talked about this whole priority and sacrifice that you have to make, and it's the mentality and the understanding of what you're doing and understanding how your life is going to change. And so I always say that you're living in a bubble, okay, um, which is different than having a normal job, right? You can't go you know, you're young, you're 19, you're 20 years old. What do they do? They go to parties, they drink, they hang out with their friends. There's nothing about them that, that uh, isn't a normal person, right? But a professional athlete, level athlete can't do that. An athlete planning to run at the Olympic games can't do that, okay? So um, then you have to surround yourself around people who understand that also. And then that's tough. So you can't lifestyle changes and sacrifices that you have to make a uh, very big time
little bit when I when I discussed the training aspect of it of why um, as a youth a training session can be maybe up to two hours as an elite that could be doubled easily okay and not only that um, one place to see physio or this um, therapist or uh, Cairo or all these different things that you could to do in one day that um, it's outside of just what you're doing on the track. Um, so your friends, your significant others, um, all, all of those people have to understand what your goal is, right? And they have to understand, um, you know, support, that is huge. Um, we have a lot of American athletes that are um, on contracts that have funding, but there's a number that do not. And they, they really rely on their families financially. So now just, um, I'm doing this for me and I want to make the Olympic team or I want to continue to do this sport. They feel an entirely new uh, amount of pressure because they have family members that are helping them pay their bills because it's very hard to work a full-time job. Um, so you're, you're ha you have also the family um, is supporting you too. And so you, you feel an even bigger obligation to make sure you're successful because, um, um, they're rewarded. So, um, then we talk about the support system from coach, medical staff, nutritionist, sports psychology. Uh, these are also people who have to understand what your goals when it is and make sure that they can fit you into their schedules because that's something have a week um, physio appointment, whether they're healthy or not, um, weekly nutritionists that they speak with, even though th even if things are going well, once a month sports psychologist, and um, a one-week massage, okay? Uh, I have one girl that is not sponsored, and she gets it donated to her. She'll reach out to these people and, and, you know, work out something to, for it to be donated. And a lot of times they can even write it off on their taxes. I, I don't know how it works in Ireland, but you know, that's just, th those are things that you have to just do and, and see if you can kind of hustle your way through it because it is very expensive, but, um, but there's always a way to make it work. Right. And if, and if it can't be once a week, it could be once a month, but those are aspects that need to be included in your ritual. make sure that um that um you're uh getting all those the extras other than than what's happening on the track um lots of traveling happens so sleep is huge um a lot of times i'll have the athletes they have these watches that will measure sleep and rest because that's thing that um sometimes and maybe it's the coaches will notice it on the track and they'll go what's going on and, um, and, and it's usually because of sleep. That's the start with. I start asking, okay, what time did you go to bed? And what time did you wake up? And a lot of times, if they're up at night on social, I'm not going to tell you. Or if they're watching Netflix or they got caught up into some um, TV show or something, and they have to watch all 30 episodes. But you remind them, um, you know, what they're doing and uh that whole time management thing but how important sleep is for an athlete huge um and sometimes stress will cause uh athletes to have trouble sleeping uh or not have uh restful sleep because of the stress of, of the sport and everything that's, that goes along with it so um uh, talked about diet and health um, I definitely, nutritionists are very expensive. Every single one of my athletes don't have a nutritionist, but I at least advise them to try to consult with someone or at least do some research on how, um, off, um, sacrifices when it comes to diet, especially, uh, for women. I think one of the 
question, but um, about how your body changes as it happens, okay? Um, at a certain age, your body isn't thinking other than being a baby making machine and it's not care that you want to be in a and, and so the changes are going to be there it's it's hormonal I have to uh be prepared for that i have a now that i'm dealing with that um their bodies are changing and they're like i'm not doing anything different and this is normally how i eat and, and i'm like yeah but you're you're not 17 you know and um and just that understanding that um you know is is trying to do something you want it to do so you have to make sure that you know about your diet and how it works for you everybody different do some research talk to some or someone on your in your national program that uh can consult with athletes i, I it's really important because you know, we have that and they kind of sit and, and, and uh, only maybe talk to probably five or 10 percent of the population. And, and these athletes don't even know that they have that opportunity to do that. And they don't understand how important that is. So that thing, the reason I brought it up is because I've had to tell every one of my athletes to do it and they never thought of it on their own. So um, because you, you just think, oh, well, I'll just not eat sugar this week or I'll just lay off of this or I'll just say it's a whole a uh, plan that can come together and can maximize performance if you're doing it right. So that's one of the things that I would definitely encourage um, elite athletes to do is come up with a, um, a, uh, a plan and a lifestyle, not something that you're only going to do for a month or two weeks or something like that, but a lifestyle as an athlete that, uh, you know, is, is constant. Um, Certain supplements, and I'm not. Um, it's good to make sure that your body isn't low in iron. You're not low in vitamin D. You're not low in calcium. Those are things like at the beginning of the year. I think it's important to go get like some blood work done and just make sure that your body isn't lacking because um, usually with diet, sometimes there will be, um, and especially being in Ireland. And one of the things when I was in Illinois that I found is everyone everyone was low in vitamin D. And that made a huge difference in performance. But um, we didn't know at first. We were so obsessed with iron. <laughs> and we were testing iron like once every couple months. And what we, what we uh, failed to realize is that the sun didn't come out six months of the year. <laughs> and when it did, it was only out a couple hours a day. And so we were missing uh, vitamin D. And so that, that ended up being something really big that when we implemented that into um, and um and that was for our young athletes so these are ones you think are out running around in the um you know and, and doing things outdoors and they're not um but again that was a difference in the climate too and um and where we were as opposed to being here in texas oh we get a lot more sunlight so um and those kind of things help prevention with of injuries too so i i, I noticed that the iron of course vitamin d um calcium those are the main ones that, that I would always kind of get checked just to make sure that, um, that, um, that you're getting the, the right, uh, one eats different. Um, we talked about mental health, mental health, mental health is really, really big. Um, a lot of times athletes just want someone else that to, that's not their coach. That's not their family. Um, that's not another athlete that they can just kind of dump stuff things start to get frustrating because you're not always going to run fast at every practice. You're not going to run fast at every meet. And sometimes you just feel like you're spinning your wheels and um, waiting for the next track meet to come up and, and you have all these big gigantic goals and maybe it doesn't happen. So every now and then it's really good to have um, someone else to consult with. Um, even if you do it every every once in a while it's really good for athletes to be able to do that um hydration is huge uh we all have water bottles i really wish i had mine on me but they have um these uh measurements on it where they fill it up each day and, and each day they kind of um go down and I, I made sure every single person in the group has it 
um, because it, it makes it it makes a difference. A lot of times, these athletes, even though they're at the elite level, they just still don't understand. She's my oldest athlete. She's 27 years old now, and she had it was a couple days where she just kept cramping and cramping and cramping. And I'm like, are you drinking enough water? Like that, that would be too simple. You know, you're almost 30 years old. That would be just too simple. Right. And then she's like, yeah, yeah, I think I am. And then it turns out she's totally dehydrated. Totally. De Jug oh, you're dehydrated. No wonder. And so that's when I started making them all get the big water bottle and, and the where they have the measure. So it's just little things that you don't think of that um you think only a 15 year old would have to deal with but um but no so um uh, unfortunately as coaches we have to continue to uh set reminders for our athletes of, of what they're doing uh week to week um but mainly that they what they have to do is invest in themselves they have to constantly invest in themselves and when i was an athlete the thing that i kept reminding myself of is of is that i'm an athlete 24 7. there's never a time and that doesn't mean you can't have fun and enjoy your life but even in those moments you have to remember that you're an athlete okay um and so that's where i say investing in yourself because you can do all this work in one week and lose it all in a weekend and have to start all over and so that's uh not only frustrating and disappointing for an athlete, but it's it's really frustrating for a coach because we can't be with them all all the time. We can we can only be with them, you know, when they're on the track and during those other mentoring sessions. But otherwise, um, the majority of their life, they're going to have to do it on their own, and and we're counting on them to to stay uh, dedicated to it until the next time that we see them. Um, so we talked a little. bit bit about um you know what it's like to be a, a female athlete and i'm sure a lot of you guys have female um athletes and um i think they're drastically different than coaching men i i, I uh you know it's it, being a female coach it's it's rare um i know i know here in the states i'm a i'm a, a huge minority and um most of the coaches most of all of our female athletes have male coaches and um they don't ask questions they just coach them exactly the same way they coach their men um we uh we have a usa track and field group and we have a, a an elite coaching group and we sit on this call and i i listen to a lot of the male coaches uh complain that oh there's this caddy stuff going on or that this there's this going on and there's this emotional this going on and i'm like we're women what do you expect you expect it suddenly to be different because we want to go to the olympic games um that makes no sense so I do notice with that there is involved in their preparation. Okay. And what I mean by that is, is that there's a priority list and that priority list may, um, getting their hair done, getting their nails done, their friendships, um their their personal relationships everything kind of is equal right um and when you have a list of 10 things that are on your list and five of them all have um the same equal intensity then you're going to miss out on something okay so we had this discussion about how one coach can have male athletes and female athletes but it seems to be when they get to the track meets that the women um, mechanics are not as sharp as the guys mechanics, okay? And I don't wanna go off the deep end with this, but there was this huge discussion about this. And so I said, hey, Mimi, uh, let me throw something in. Uh, and it, it turned out that when the male athletes come to practice, that's their job, this is it. Something is just I'm coming to the track and I'm taking care of my business, and women don't do that. They they don't do that gate and all of a sudden everything is off the table. Okay, and so when you have all these things whirling around in your head, then it's hard to be sharply focused on this drill that I'm doing. Right. So one thing that I I 
Sometimes when they walk, you know, I can even, sometimes I can just look at their face and can tell that there's some additional stress there. And I'm saying, hey, get it together. Let's focus on this and let's get going, right? Because I've had a group where I've had male and female athletes. And it seems to be even that that intensity for the guys is very high. Like it's almost like they're at a race. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be 85% today. And I'm, I have to back them off. Whereas the ladies, I'm saying, hey, I need you at 85%. So it's always this push to get the intensity a little bit higher than I want it. And, um, and being a female, I don't have a problem saying that. I, I mean, I, I get it. You know, I do it with, uh, with my own job too. So um, I think there is this sense of, you know, if, if there's a boyfriend breakup or something like that, I, I just see that a lot of times um, – the, the women will take it a lot more personally and it's hard to kind of get away from that focusing on their that day. Okay. So that's something I think as a coach, you need to really have a good enough relationship with your athletes to be able to see if they're walking through the door stress, because um, you might have to give them a little pet talk, talk to remove that so that they can really uh, get locked in and dialed into what they're doing that day. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about personal relationships. Um, that was, that's one of the things that I've seen that's kind of been the biggest distraction that I don't have as much with the youth is uh, when um, my female athlete starts to get, start to get into really serious uh, find that fine line of um, how much time you're investing, right? Because we talked about time management. And um, when you're working really hard on these personal relationships, they take away time that you need to be focused on your job. So that's one of the things that I try to, um, you know, redirect my athletes with. But at the same time, I can't, I can't be too involved in their personal lives either, right? Because then that the athlete will back, they will push away from you. Be like, uh-uh, this is this is not where I need you to be interfering. So there's kind of that fine line too of of um of how to make that work. I happen to be an athlete. I told you before that that had a child in the middle of my career. So I ended up getting married and and having a child in the middle of my career. And now when I look back, um there was a period that um, if I were my coach, I would have wanted to kill me. But um, I didn't notice it at the time. <laughs> I, did, I didn't realize how unfocused I was. And, um, and now, you know, like I said, I'm 50 years old now and I'm over 25 years removed from that. And now I can see how big of a distraction that was. Um, I was able to make it work. But, um, but uh, I, I definitely think at, at some point... Uh, after 95 and 96, I could have been a lot more successful than I was. But, um, you know, thank God I was able to do some things before then. It's not uh, something I recommend, but at the same time, um, it's hard to postpone your life when it's moving in a direction that feels natural, right? So um, that's tough. But uh, at the same time, um, I think it's, it's our job as coaches to make it work because um, right now you will see that there are, I don't even think there's more than before. I just think they make a bigger deal about it now um, of, of these uh, female athletes who are now having children in the middle of their careers. I, I, I commend it and I think it's great, but um, it, it seems to be like it's now, uh, they're making a bigger deal about it now than they, they used to, which is, um, which is kind of cool. But, um, but it, it, you can definitely do it, but it, it definitely, I think, takes a, a toll on, uh, on your career at one point, especially in track and field, because there's a lot of time that you have to take off to do that. So let's move on. Um, kind of uh, threw this in with some of the other ones, the coach athlete relationship. Um, so ultimately what I always say, it's, it's about the athletes, right? It's not really about us as coaches. Um, hopefully we've, you know, done enough, you know, um, either in our careers athletes or in our career, uh, in our other, careers that we do that we're satisfied that we're not trying to live our lives of American coaches doing that. And um, it's frustrating for me to see because I, I like the focus to be on the athletes and not on um, 
my athlete won this medal. So look how great I am. You know, so I know um, I see that a lot here. I don't know, um, you know, how it is there, but I see a lot of American coaches are really, especially at the elite level, get really big on that kind of stuff. And they start to try to make it about them. And I think it's important to keep the focus on um, the athletes and their goals and um, just being a motivational leader for them. So constantly encouraging, motivating, and making sure that they're reaching their goals. Um, And a lot of times keep redirecting and redirecting because as I said before, you start training in like September and this thing goes all the way through August and September of the next year. (laughs) It's it's a year long uh, system that just continues to cycle. So it's very difficult to maintain anything like that over and over again. So um, we as coaches have to know what the goals are. Uh, They have to be short term and you have to make sure that they're constantly reaching it week to week. Um, And that starts with having great communication skills. So we have a meet, we're leaving today. And I've sat with every single person and discussed, what is your goal for this weekend? Not what is your goal by the end of the year, but what are we trying to accomplish this weekend, right? Because if they're thinking that they're supposed to run a personal best and I know that they're not ready to do that and I know that that's not realistic and they go to the meet and it doesn't happen, then they're disappointed and they feel like they failed. And now we're starting all over again, trying to get um, them uh, back on track. So one thing that I think... um, is a little bit different from the youth to the elite level is every single race that you compete in is so competitive. Every single time you get on the track is it's probably compared to one of the toughest races that you're ever going to run. We just don't get a lot of opportunities now to have those kind of down races. So you have to know what your goal is, right? Um, and it, it, it isn't always going to be to shatter a record or to run a personal best. But a lot of times in their minds, they'll think that. And, um, and then you just have to start all over again with, um, with re-motivating. So you don't want to have that, you don't want to have that drop, right? If you can sit down and both parties know what they're dealing with and they know what the goal is by the end of that week, and then you can start Monday and you haven't skipped a beat. So, um, and then I, again, it's important to find that perfect match between coach and athlete. Uh, And sometimes they don't, it's not always good. I personally would not coach anyone that I don't get along with. And I know a lot of coaches say, you know, this is a business, I'm just doing business, but it just never works. So if, if if there is not a good personality match, then for me, it's just not gonna work because I don't think it's gonna help the athlete either. And um, I'm not uh, a a, a big pushover. I'm not going to get pushed over pretty easily. And I know some athletes are very aggressive. And I I always um, tell my athletes that um, I feel like I'm a hundred times more, um, uh, I would say mentally tougher than they are (laughs) just because I like to mess with them like that. But, um, but I'm like, yeah, if you want to try it with somebody, I'm I'm not the one you want to try it with. So uh, right away, they know that if they're slipping up or if I need to be, honest and hold them accountable, I will do it. Okay. Um, and I think that's the best thing too, because, you know, they don't straggle into practice late. They don't half-ass in the warm up. They don't do the same on cool down. You know, it's, it's serious business and they know. And so most young people want a coach that is going to be demanding is going to be honest and truthful with them, is going to hold them accountable, and, um, and has structure. They want that. And so um, I think as a coach, it's your, that's your responsibility to give that to them. You know, they, there should be uh, that, that sense of, I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> sort of thing, you know. And, and again, there's, there's nothing that could actually happen to them, but I just want to have that, that level of respect where they know, um, you know, showing up five minutes late, for practice isn't going to work for me. False starting in practice is not going to work. Um, you know, those are the kind of things that I think uh, is important to uh, have them understand because you don't, 
as a youth, a lot of, um, you know, maybe coming up in a program with a lot of other young people and everybody's at so many different levels and you're the best one, you might've got spoiled a little. I know that happens here a lot. And then it gets to a point where now, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, spoil you anymore. You have to be, um, this has to be very serious and I'm, I'm going to have to be the one that uh, holds you accountable and they have to be able to accept honest criticism because um, without that, then everybody's fooling themselves in it. And I don't think it, it will ever work. So uh, we talked about goal setting. I like to set a goal for every single track meet. I, I'm not really big on, on week to week or practice goals or anything like that. If I have a certain goal that I want to see to meet, I include that in the training myself, right? Sometimes you go through weeks where you're like, okay, we're just doing some developmental stuff and we're just figuring things out. And eventually I want to know where we are. Well, then I'll set that up in the training. So maybe I'll start pulling my stopwatch out and timing things and, and making sure that we are where we're at. But um, uh, that's performance goals. But um, in terms of Competition, I make sure that every single competition has some kind of goal that's set just to make sure that the athlete, you and the athlete are on the same page. Um, I think that's very, very important at the elite level because um, it reminds the athlete that what they're doing is all worth it. Because we talked about all these sacrifices that they're making. Um, when they have a competition, they need to come out of that feeling like they got something accomplished. And then if they didn't, that's when you need to go back to the drawing board to figure out um, what's what's not happening that, that could be, um, you could be doing better. I don't want to, did I go back? Okay, talk about training a little bit. So one of the things about being a youth athlete and being an elite athlete is taking responsibility for your training. So your coach is going to give you a workout. You have to be totally responsible day to day. And that starts with uh, your warm-up, having a very, very advanced warm-up. Now, with my younger athletes, I used to give them an actual warm-up on a card that they had to do step by step to make sure that they were doing everything the way I wanted them to do it. Um, I don't do that at the elite level. I let them come out, do their own thing. They all kind of have their little routines that they like to do. But um, that's me holding, letting them have responsibility for that. But you also have to be a student of your sport. You have to watch videos. You have to understand, um, you know, what's required from the event that you do, who the other athletes are going to be competing again, what do, you know, who's out there what do they do well i remember sitting watching just videos and videos and videos and videos on vhs of um sandra farmer patrick and sally gunnell and all these people from who who were older than me but that were getting the job done in, in the event that i wanted to be great at so um and now it's even easily accessible because it's right on the internet now but i i don't think that our athletes are as studious as they should be in understanding and learning you shouldn't know more about their event than they know okay <laughs> um it, it's very very important that they understand that it's very important that they watch videos of themselves in practice it's very important that they watch videos of themselves competing okay um these are things that they don't have to do with you as a coach this is thing that they can be doing on their own and we talked about this time management that they have to really understand this sport and understand their event and come to training every single day with a purpose every single one of my athletes has a diary daily diary so that they can write down things that went well in training things that didn't go well how they felt that day um, sometimes if they didn't have a good night's sleep or whatever they can jot that down um, I have recurring training sessions where most of the time they're going to do a session that they've already done before, and that's intentional, so that when they do it the second and third time, they can compare notes of how they felt when they did it. The first time is usually the introduction, the second time is progression, and then the third time is to master it. And then every other time you do it after that, it should already be mastered. So, but if you're writing these diet, if you have this diary, and you can flip back. So I don't, I don't know if you guys know Courtney Okolo, but she was my 400 meter runner. Every single day she would write notes like she was writing 
you know, paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of what happened that day, you know? And she has an eight year diary of every single day of training. Okay. <laughs> so every time that she sees it's come, one of the workouts that we do is coming up and she goes, Oh yeah. And she'll go back to years and say, Oh, I remember uh, I ran, this is the best one I did on this workout. And so she's coming to training, challenging herself to beat her own times that she did three years ago. Right. So, um, that's the kind of thing that I mean in investing in yourselves. Right. And, and that's another thing when we talk about transitioning, when you're not a kid anymore and this is business, those are some of the things that you have to do. So, um, and it's super important and um, you'll definitely see results better when you do stuff like that. Um, as a coach, I uh, like to, if I have an athlete that's a youth athlete or I can either talk to a coach that's work with uh, an athlete that I'm, I didn't have as a youth, I can kind of talk to that coach about what were their weaknesses. And then you can emphasize and work on the weaknesses to make sure that um, you're going to start seeing improvements. Because with anybody, my son plays basketball, he's a lefty. And I'm like, you got to spend more time dribbling with your right hand than you do with your left. And I do the same thing with my 400 hurdlers. Like they have this unpreferred and non-preferred and I spend more time with the non-preferred than we do with the preferred. So the more you can focus on facilities, the better. Uh, we got about five more minutes. So uh, this is, a, tr this is a, tr a sample training session. And the reason that I wanted you, one of my athletes is calling me right now. One, the reason I wanted you to see this is I want you, just wanted you to see how it's broken down into kind of sections. So it's, it has like a five sec. This first part in gray is the warm up. That's just kind of, a sample of, of things you can do and warm up. The second part is drills. Now, let me tell you why I focus on drills is that in case, in the event that they didn't do the warm up as quality as I would like it, then they're going to get it done because I'm going to throw in some drills, right? <laughs> so I never transition straight from the warm up to the meat of the, the session because I always throw in some kind of drills, you know, and I mean organized drills like certain amount of a skips or um wickets which this is you might just call it a different but this is this drill right I, we call them wickets some people call them baby hurdles that's my group standing back there um so we'll do we'll do uh things like that just to make sure that and they also get you know uh drills and stuff done with their mechanics so that's good um Hold on one second here. Um, and then go into the, the meat of the workout. And then there's the cool down, which I make sure that cool down is just as important as warm up. And then I always do mobility after the cool down because stretching is huge. And um, if you don't stay organized with it, they will kind of stroll off the track. And the next thing you do, you're turning your back to put away hurdles and there's a, a, a smoke coming out of the back of a car. And you're like, wait a minute, we got so much more we need to get done here <laughs> to make sure that, um, that your, your body is, is the, uh, you're taking care of yourself. So those are things that I, you know, it doesn't matter how old they get, you have to continue to monitor. So uh, the second part, the third part, and the, uh, the second, fourth and fifth part is me monitoring to make sure that, that, um, that they are taking care of themselves the way they need to. Um, those, that's just an example of drills. Um, and there's so many, you know, you guys can do, you can do so much stuff, hurdle drills, um, accelerate. Here's another one, another sample. And I, you see the warm ups at the top. The second part is an acceleration drill where we do a lot of different, um, sidestep and go it's it's more um you know just getting your body to move a certain way but you're also doing a lot of good warm-up stuff stride frequency is another one so you're you're stride frequency but at the same time um it helps to make sure that you're actually prepared to do the session when it's time to cool down and then the mobility uh this is a sample of weight so I will tell you with my coaching philosophy, I'm not big on weights. I'm not, and what I mean by that is I know there's a lot of American coaches that lift five days a week. No, I do two days a week and it's not super heavy, but we're mainly focusing on 
the closed chain, the open chains, the, 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 the power of like cleans. I love doing step ups, love doing deadlifts and back squats, um, but mainly a lot of hip flexion stuff. I think the hip flexion stuff is huge. A lot of sprinters can totally uh, change performance by focusing on the hip flexion. So, and you can, you, do, you just do it with bands. You can start out by doing a lot of it with body weight and then moving to bands. You don't need 300 pounds on your back um, to, to get those movements correct because, you know, it's just really important because in sprinting, you know, it all starts in the hips. So um, I, would, I would do some research on some really good um, hip, hip flexion, flexion and hip, hip strengthening weight room. So if you include them in your weight session, you know they're always going to get done a couple of days a week. Um, one of the case studies, because we're almost to the end, is um, Ashley Spencer. And I, I like to um, talk to you a little bit about Ashley because she started with me at a very young age. I recruited her when she was 16, 17. She ended up showing up on campus when she was 18. Did not do the youth track, never had an extensive um, youth career or anything like that but immediately under 20 she just hit the ground running and was world world champion in the 400 she ran 50.5 and then um tore it up on the transitioned quickly from that into being a professional and um i will say that i've had her the longest but i've had the toughest time with her just understanding how transition is and how serious that she needs to take it. Um, she's the one I was telling you that I needed to get the water bottle with the labels on it. Um, but, um, you know, she's one that I'm always reminding you got a warm, cool, do your warm intensity in your training. There's always something. Most of everything that I've talked to you in relationships, um, all I've experienced with Ashley Spencer, and she wouldn't have a problem with me telling you this because she knows she's my problem child. But um, but uh, she did get a medal in Rio, um, and that was learning an, an entirely new event. She got all of these youth things were um for the 400 meters <laughs> so her first year running the 400 was 16 and she got a medal that year um so as you can see it's very difficult uh, to convince somebody how much better they need to be when they're doing and it's not good enough we gotta do this and you can you can change this and you can fix this and you can be more focused on this and you can be more dedicated to this and you can spend more time doing this um and so that's what i've constantly had to do with her and um i don't think it's ever going to stop but that's a a huge example of how doing all we talked about makes a difference Okay, I feel like she had the ability and should have been on the podium in Doha. Even though two young ladies broke the world record, I still think she should have been there and she wasn't. And a lot of it was because of um, lack of commitment and lack of dedication. So um, those are uh, a lot of the things that, that I mentioned here. I, it's really important. And you, as a coach, you have to continue to remind, 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 remind. Um, Cheyenne Salmon is the Jamaican girl I was telling you about that did compete in Doha. And, um, you know, she, she, uh, her, her uh, dad passed away when she was really young. Her mom was, um, uh, ended up moving to uh, London. And so she hasn't seen her mom since she was 10, uh, the same year that her dad passed away. Um, so she was living kind of like in a, um, a boarding school in Jamaica. She's with me now, and so here she is in, in be a foreign country for her, um, just trying to figure this whole track thing out. And so what I'm guiding her in is in, in trying to help her develop into this athlete who 
um, had all this success, successes in under 20, and now having to manage uh, transitioning into this new lifestyle, because that's what it is. You're not living in a dorm surrounded around all other track people who all have one, one uh, focus in mind. And so um, uh, she's right now the one that I'm working the hardest into understanding what it is to be a professional and, um, and making this sport a lifestyle so that she can avenge um, her goal. She five one in the 400 hurdles right now. And, um, and I really think she can, she could be a high 52, low 53 athlete here in the next couple of years. So it's going to, it's going to work. Um, minute break. And then we can come back and um, go into some questions. Okay. Cool with that, Daniel? Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I did mention I'm middle aged, so I'm going to go to the restroom and I'll meet you guys back here in about five minutes. <laughs> right? No problem. Like guys, if you want to take a short break there and we come back if anyone has any questions. Tanya, you you okay? To take some questions now. Hey. Hey guys, anyone got any shy, questions? Guys. Uh, I started, Daniel. You go, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. I, so that was, that was enjoyed it. Um, the question I have for you there is just. Just about the group you spoke about, uh, you have summoned all female. Um, I suppose just the importance of the group. Um, do do they train like competitively together often, um, or do you would would a lot of their runs visual? Uh, and then picked seven as like it's just it, it's, is it difficult to coach any more? Than Number, I suppose, of athletes and see in it. Okay, so 
okay, so to answer the first part of it, uh, we we do we go as a whole group. Sometimes I will when we start to get really serious about technical stuff, I'll separate some hurdlers out. But mainly, um, that's the vantage point is to have together. So it's not so I don't do I don't use the watch as much as I know a lot of people do. I in recovery. So when you see this slide here and you see this the a the accelerations it's like two minutes rest three minutes rest six minutes i i'm like a stickler to that like i'm obsessed with that more so than i am of how fast you're going to get it done because that's where you get your fitness and stuff from is making sure that you stick to recoveries okay if you're if it's supposed to be five minutes and they're and they're taking seven minutes to get themselves together and then another two to walk to the line well now you've changed the whole um complexity of the training and it doesn't do what you intended for it to do. So what I do in terms of putting them together is I match them up with um, equal abilities. So I will run my 400 runners. There's the two or three of them. I'll run them together and then I'll run the short sprinters together in groups so they can kind of feed off of each other. But one of the reasons why a couple of them have migrated to my group is so that they can train with other elites. So that's why it's important to, to make sure that most of the sessions is them going up against each other. So even with block starts and stuff like that, we will do um, the uh, a normal training session. They're not racing. They're not challenging each other, but they're pushing each other. Right. Then there are some days where we're doing block starts and I'm like, I want to see who can get to the 30 the fastest or I want to see who can get to the 10 the fastest. So there is a competitive aspect to it. And that's actually what really um, makes us special is because I have three girls in the, uh, the group that, that are all 10 nine. Right. So if you can constantly uh, challenge yourself against somebody else that you're at your own ability, then that's great. And you don't really get that as often. Um, so uh one thing you can have with the girls is have a guy that maybe a, a boy who is um, uh, maybe not as elite and that they can help challenge them. I know that's how Allison Felix trained, she trained or, and still does in, um, in California. She always has a male training partner <laughs> that, uh, that she works with just to, just to have that constant push. And it's, I think, um, It gets pretty tough. So, and then the second part of your question was what? Remind me. So he's came out of the college system. I had three, and I wanted to find one person to train with that person. And so my goal was six. I ended up with seven. Or I, had, I ended up with eight. Um, now I have seven because one has a shoe company issue. That's a whole nother subject. But um, so I think I could handle two or three more because like I said, when I start to separate into sessions anyway, so I'll have a separate hurdle session where only my hurdle hurdler will be there. So if there was two or, or three, I could manage that. But the more you start to have, you're going to have to do separate sessions. You cannot have one big two hour training session and, and work with 10 or 11 elite athletes. So um, that's the decision that I, I've turned away a lot of people because of that, because I'm not really, really willing at this point to um, have to manage that much. And I don't really have to where I have to do that financially or something. I will, but right now, no. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, I have, a, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Hi, hi Tanya. Um, the, just in the concept of, um, I, I was interested in you were saying that for every meet, you share your goal, right? So, um, transition whereby, you know, I can imagine, you know, a superstar kid coming through, then they're moving in grown men and grown women. I started 
good, what is okay, and what is like what's a bad outcome. But I actually never share that with the app. When you're sharing that goal with them, how do, how specific do you get? Will it be almost you know just to be, will it be, will it be very specific around the time or um, you know can can you maybe share something around that and how you might can set the context around what a goal would be for for a meet? That's a great question. And so here it is. It's it's ultimately a mind game, okay? Uh, because what we want to accomplish when we get to the other end of that competition is that they don't feel bad about themselves, right? Um, so what I do is I'm very specific. What I do is I go and do research and I find out what is this athlete's best opener, right? So here we are in January and um, uh, I don't want to go look at their PRs. That's not going to help me, right? <laughs> so I go, okay, we're running a 300. What is the fastest 300 you've ever opened up with? So if I have a, a girl that's, oh, I've run 37.5 indoors in a, in a 300. Well, now I have a benchmark, right? And then I can start discussing with her. Okay, well, look, it looks like you've ran 37.5 uh, this time. Another time you ran a 37.9. So if we, if you can get down to 37.3 or something in this meet, I think we're, we're on track. We're doing pretty good, right? So even if they run 37.5 or 37.7, they're not as far off from their best as they've been before. Other than them thinking, I'm feeling really great. I got this new coach now. I think I can run a 36.3 if I put my mind to it, right? And then they go out and run a 37.5 and now they're totally crushed. So I actually am very specific about the time that I think they're capable of doing. I let them know what that is. And more than likely, I'm usually right. And if I am that wrong, I need to know that I'm that wrong, right? Because then I need to do something different in my coaching. So no, it's, I don't want to just say, hey, go out and do your best and do, because that's, that's a little bit too um, youth style for me. Like th this is serious business now. So we do want it to be, there needs to be a expectation that needs to be pretty advanced, but at the same time, it needs to be something that you as a coach know they can achieve pretty close to. I actually will give them a time goal that I want them to be in that range of that I think that I know they can do. And it, and it, then I, I, you know, you have, you have a, a, a girl named Phil your girl feel and I think she just ran a personal best and um if you're starting her if it's her first meet and you go hey I want you to run 23.5 this meet and like oh god that's kind of crazy because that's close to her personal best but if you say okay what well, looks like every time you've opened up the season you've run 23.9 so or 24 flat well if she does that then she's like okay I'm right on track or maybe I'm a little bit ahead of where I need to be right and it just puts, puts things in perspective as opposed to having the softy goals. Or most of the time, the apples are probably higher. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Tony. Go ahead, right. go ahead, go ahead, go um, ahead. Hi, Tanya. Um, just, it was a very, very informative uh, presentation. Thank you very much for uh, giving up your time to, to do that for us. Um, here in Ireland, we've got a lot of athletes who have got, um, who have got the ability and they've got the potential that you talked about um, at youth level, but it's transitioning them to that senior level. How do we get that mindset right for them? Because you talked a lot about, um, you know, them taking ownership of, of it and responsibility. Um, how do we get them into that mindset? Have you, have you ever had to experience that? Yeah, you know, um, so, uh, you know, we'll talk about Ashley Spencer again. That was the one I was telling you about. And I think the problem starts with the fact that you're just that gifted, right? Um, you know, I... I just really good half. I mean, they're not going to work as hard at it as someone else that knows they, I got to really work harder. You know, for her, I always get, gave her little motivations, 
right? It, there always had to be some sort of motivation. And usually it's just kind of reminding her again, what they're not doing. Um, but I think when you're talking about, so when she was young, it was more so just trying to have her to understand that it is a job and a business, right? and continuing to motivate her in those ways. So, um, and also reminding the athlete that everybody is talented. You get to a certain level, everybody is at this level. There's nothing that's special about you now in terms of genetics. Now you have to make yourself special. You have to do other athletes right? If there's a list of 10 upgrade, they're doing this, well, what are you not all these, but then you got to include some other things on top of it. Those are the uh, mentioned about the constant reminders. It's not just about writing the workouts up and making sure you're standing there with a stopwatch is the constant reminders of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because remember, we started out with the why. And possible by saying like, this is what you want to do. I'm just trying to help you, right? I'm not forcing you to be an elite next level athlete. This is something that you want. I'm just trying to help you to get here. So it's my responsibility to remind you and why you're doing it. Um, I think the one thing is to acknowledge that their ability that they've been blessed with is now starting to be equalized with other people with the same ability. Because what you've done is now you've eliminated everybody else that don't, that just genetically doesn't have it to be at this level. So now everybody that's trying to be at this level, they've got the same thing you got. Now you got to do something different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a, sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah. And I, it actually, I was one of those athletes. It took me time to figure that out because everything was just always so easy. I had gained a bunch of weight um, and it was, I was taking birth control pills and did not realize that that was what was causing the weight. Right. And so then I had gotten convinced myself that I'm just a big girl and I can just run, I can run fast big. A lot of big girls like me can't run fast. So, you know, you're just giving yourself excuses for why you don't have to put in the work, <laughs> why you don't have to watch your diet and why you don't have to go on a run on Christmas day, right? Um, and th those are things like when, when the holidays came around, I said, hey, let me just let everybody know we're not celebrating this year. We're going to be here on New Year's Day because it happens to land on a Friday. I'm just y'all know in advance, right? So it's, it's things like that, that um, you just have to continue to remind them that they have to make sacrifices that other people, even that their own ages are, don't have to make. So um, I hope that answered it for you. But Yeah, um, no, that's great. It's great. Um, you know, we do have a crop of very good um, young athletes who have transitioned now to under 23. Um, who, so this advice um, for them and their coaches um, will be invaluable, I think. So thank you very much. I think it helps too to kind of um, in maybe month to month you can pull out a person and say, hey, what, what have you done in this last month that you really feel like help you refine this part of your life. And maybe someone else might say, it was a whole water bottle thing with Ashley Spencer. She ended up having these cramps. I told her, why don't you try doing this? Because I see it's not something you can do on your own. Two weeks later, everybody in the group has a water bottle with a measurement on it. And they just kind of saw it and was like, hmm, that's a good idea. You know, so even just being around other people who you can see is try, was trying to do one little thing yeah. to make uh, their lives easier and make it easier in this sport. And then it wasn't like a news flag. Everybody go out and get water. It's kind of like, you know, one person ended up getting and the other person thought it was cool and it could help. And, you know, and it just kind of works that way. So even just kind of getting together and talking about, um, 
you know, what are you doing that you think is, is going to help you be better than another person can say, well, I should try that too. If that's, if it's working for her, it might work for me sort of thing, you know? So it's kind of a community too of, um, and I don't know how you guys are, but we like, if I, like I started using this new 1080 machine. I don't can't remember which country it was, maybe Switzerland or something that was Canadian. But um, so there's a guy here and he has this machine and he's like, hey, you want to try it out? I called four different coaches before I ever strapped any one of my athletes to it and said, okay, what is this thing going to do? What should I be putting uh, the measurements on? What are my goals? You know, before ever, you know, just start strapping my athletes up and start going. So you also have to have a coaching community too, where you can reach out to certain people and no one's afraid to like you, this workout you see on here, I can give this to every single person on this call and they can do it totally different than what it says here, or even uh, get a different goal out of it than I'm going to get. Right. So I have no fear in saying, this is what I do, or this is what has worked really well for my athletes. And, and, um, one of the things that um, I take pride in is my 400 runners, the last 100 meters of the 400, they are all continuing to move very well. So I have a lot of coaches, they come like, what are you doing over there? Um, and I'll tell them, I'm like, hey, this is what I do. It works. I'm not going to try to do anything different. I'm not going to go online and try to find a new scheme. This is what I do. And this is what works. And I have no problem uh, sharing that with the world if they want to hear it. And that doesn't mean it's going to work for you, but you know. Um, just being in a really good coaching community. And then it's the same way with the athletes being in a good athlete community where they can reach out and talk to each other about even issues that they're having or things that have helped them to, um, to be better. Because really you're all competing as one country, right? When it comes down to it, you're all going to have on the same colors. You're all, you know, wanting to have the same goals. And if you have a good sprint coach there, who's doing a good job, then um, everybody should be reaching out to each other, trying to figure out, you know, how you can help to be better, I think. Thanks, Tanya. Um, we have a question here. Daniel, from, oh, sorry. I have a question here from Paul McKee. Do you have uh, two 400 meter type athletes that you train differently to four 800 meter type athletes? Do you get that? Are you asking me the question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought. Oh, I thought, Paul. Okay, say that. Say that again. Uh, do you have two four hundred meter type athletes that you train differently to four eight hundred meter type athletes? Yeah. So I I train um, for speed, but that doesn't mean we do a lot of fast stuff, right? So what I'll do is um, I don't do a lot of long slow stuff. So let's take my uh, uh, 400 runner who's run 49.7. She's never ran anything longer and practiced in 300 meters. And I know that sounds crazy. And it's not fast, but our, it's about 85%. And it's short recovery. So it might be a 300, walk 50 meters, 200 kick. Well, that's actually a 500, right? Um, so I can actually sit here and say, well, because she's never ran more than 300 meters. But it doesn't mean she's she's not putting in volume, right? So it's still the volume of about 1500 meters, but I constantly stay at a reasonable pace where it's not slow. I just try to avoid this slow, constant uh, running where you're so tired that your mechanics break down. So I do, if I have a 400 runner, I don't ever train them like an 800 runner unless they're an 800 runner. If they're an 800 runner, then I can train them more like a 400 and go up if that makes sense. So I, I have these coaches that'll call me and go, hey, I got this 400 hurdler, but she's, um, or I have a 400 runner and she's not that fast. So um, I want to move her to the 400 hurdles. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm insulted. Um, and then secondly, if she's not fast, and then she's not gonna be a fast 400 hurdler either, right? You got to get her fast. So um, if I have a 400 runner, I want to first try to get their 200 faster right? If, if a 400 runner can go through the first 200 in one second differential from their fastest 200, then they can finish well, right? You don't want them being uh, two tenths of a second or three tenths of a second slower than their fastest 200 because they're going to die. It's not going to be effective. But then you don't also don't want them to be too slow either. So I just kind of work on 
what can this 400 runner run in a 200? What is the best time that they can run? And then kind of work backwards from there, if that makes sense. So instead of doing five 500s or three or four 500s at like a slower pace, I would rather do 300s at a faster pace with low recovery maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes, maybe a jog recovery, maybe a walk 100 recovery. So you're getting the same amount of volume, but you make the reps shorter. And then that way they can do the same volume at a faster pace. So they're going to be more 85% pace instead of 60% pace. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't throw anybody off with that. Paul, where are you at, Paul? Don't hide, Paul. Oh, that's great, Tanya. Yes, super. There's Paul. <laughs> so, Paul, you have a 400 runner that you think is a more 400 and one that you think could actually go up to the eight? Yeah, it's not that we're thinking of moving them from four to eight. It's just the, this type of style of runner they are. They're, they're more like a 600 meter runner trying to do fours. And then you have somebody else who's a, a speed <laughs> demon over 200 doing 400s. And ideally, you like them to train together. So you try and fit, you know, you try and get them to work together quite often. But at some stage, one can handle a higher volume than the other. So it's kind of hard to manage. So that's my Ashley Spencer and Courtney Ocolo. Okay. Ashley Spencer's more of it. She cannot do the volume. Courtney Ocolo can probably run a 203 800 if I wanted her to. She's actually done a 204 before. And she can just run for days like a motor and never get tired, right? I actually do have them do the same workout. I will just adjust the rest. Okay. So Ashley Spencer's going to need more recovery. Courtney's going to need less recovery. Okay. So it is kind of hard to do them in the same session at running at the same time, but you can give them the same workout. But no, it's not going to be effective to have them do it together because they're, they just, they're not a good training group. They're not a good training pair, okay? Um, and, and that is tough, and I have that. But you just, there's no way to make a person who has this um, really, really good quick twitch and can't handle volume and can't handle low recovery or short recovery, that person can't train with a person that can handle short recovery better. It, just, it won't work. Yeah, so you can, either, you can either change the session and have them do the session together with a different. So, for example, um, Courtney, I'll have her run the three. Now, she only needs two minutes and she's going to kick a 200. Maybe Spencer will just do the three and then we're done. So they can run the 200 together. Right. They just can't do the 200 kick together. But it's still going to be effective for Ashley because her running at that 300 pace is, is great for her. If her running that 200 kick is going to look like garbage and she's lost all of her mechanics and her knees are barely coming off the ground, why do I want her to do it anyway? Because it's, it's counterproductive, right? So if you know you have two people and you need them to train in a session together, <clears throat> then you just have to do two different workouts that they can do at the same time, okay? So let's say you have the 300, 200, 300, two minutes rest, 200 kick, and then there's seven minutes between that session. Well, one of them, they both run the three together. The other person rests two minutes and runs the kick. The other person's waiting for the next session or, or next uh, segment of the workout. You can definitely do it that way, okay? Where it will work where they can do it together and they but because uh, a lot of times the person who can do more volume actually needs to do more volume. The other person doesn't need to do that much volume to get the quality of work done that they need to do. So for example, if that session is 1500 meters of volume, then maybe Spencer's only going to end up doing eight, but it's going to be good for her because her body is wired to do that. Whereas Courtney needs 1500. Okay. So you don't have to say, well, I got to come out here for two hours and work with you and then come out here another two hours and work with you because you can't train together, right? You can have them lining up together and doing similar things, but in a different way. It's just being, um, being a little bit creative with it. But it's good to know your athletes and know that this person can handle this and this person can't. That's, that's, that's valuable. Yeah, no, that's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I actually... Um, especially being in a college system, you have that all the time where they just, yeah. you know, the athletes are just wired differently. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?
Tanya, I'd just like to say um, thank you very much because I, I found a lot of your points very interesting and really, really relevant. Um, I think sometimes we overlook the simple, straightforward things and you really brought them home, some of the things you really need to look at. And I work as the pathway manager with a lot of the young athletes coming through in our system. And I took a lot of things home that I really look forward to kind of sharing with them because I know a lot of their coaches are here and they'll already share them. So thank you. I think it was really, really relevant and really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Any other questions, guys? Da Daniel, I'm going to ho hop in with a second one because I can't let yes. Tanya go without a 4-H four, a four question. And, and again, it is kind of transition related. Um, obviously, you know, it takes a long time to learn 400 meter hurdles but you know particularly if you've got a you know an 18 or a 19 year old girl she might have a stride pattern it could be 17 she's getting stronger she's getting faster uh she might be dropping to 16 ultimately going to 15 there's challenges with that because she's going on to that unpreferred leg for maybe a season or two it can be frustrating uh any any tips are kind of even uh, horror stories and how you can through it uh, from from that kind of context from that from that perspective sorry I'll start with myself as the horse because I, I didn't even uh, know how to alternate. So that's the horror story to start out with. Um, most of the athletes now really can hurdle, you know, maybe not as well with both, but you know, they're figuring it out. What I do is um, it doesn't need to, it, it doesn't take that long to, um, to get comfortable with that unpreferred because you need to be doing it more in training than you're doing the preferred leg. You don't need to work as hard on the preferred. You have to work on the unpreferred, even if you're only going to alternate for one hurdle, right? Because it has to be very, uh, it has to be close to natural. And usually when you're alternating, you're alternating in fatigue, right? And it's always scary to do something that you're not comfortable with when you're tired, right? So if I'm doing um, a 400 hurdle, session now here's the different things with the 400 hurdles and i don't want to go get too deep into this but with the 100 hurdles there's three steps so you don't really and they're short they're closer together when you're doing 400 hurdles in order to get and they're 35 meters apart so in order to do go over three hurdles you got to run almost 100 meters just to get that done right so that's a lot so what i'll do is i change the measurements to shorten them up where you can do a five step that has the exact same um uh, distance that you would do a 15 stride, right? And the same with a 16 stride and the same with a 17 stride. And so I figured out how to measure that where I can do five steps that emulates the 15 stride pattern, right? Um, seven steps that emulate or six steps that emulate the 16 step pattern. So, um, and then just kind of work on that and work on alternating that way. But the key to, to changing taking away steps, meaning going from a 17 to a 16 is going to be speed and power. Okay. They have to, they have to be a better overall sprinter to be able to do that. You're not going to do that in mechanics. You're not going to get that, do that in hurdle technique, right? In order to cover more ground, you got to get faster and stronger. Okay. If they can't do it and they're struggling to do it, then you just got to have them go. I'm going to tell you that this is very, very interesting. So back in the 90s, myself, Kim Batten, we ran 15 to 16 to 17 strides coming home. No one does that anymore. Nobody runs 17 strides because everybody felt, feels like the less steps, the better, right? The less steps I run, the faster I'm going to run. And that is not the case because there's a thing called stride frequency, right? So we were coming home the last two hurdles in 17 strides. And if you watch those videos, you can just see this really quick frequency. And, it, and, and in fatigue, that's the way you, you want to run. You don't want to run long and, and over-exaggerated when you're tired because then that equates to slow. So if you're a 400 hurdler coach and you're on the call, don't be afraid of more steps. Just figure out how to make it work for your athlete. It's okay to go 16 strides down the backstretch if that is the most comfortable and most efficient way to do it. Because as a 400 hurdler, the race starts at hurdle six. 
If you gassed yourself in the first six hurdles, I can guarantee you, you're not going to be successful. By the time you get to hurdle six, you should be just getting started. So what you want to do is those first six hurdles have to be as easy, as smooth and efficient as possible, but at the same time, aggressive and, and fast, right? So if that means if I've got my athlete working her butt off or his butt off down the back stretch to get these, you know, longer strides, then that's not, that's not a good recipe. It's Byron Robinson, the kid I told you that ran against Barr, he was, he ran 16 strides. He's a guy and he ran 16 to 17. That was the stride pattern from the, from the block, 16 steps to 17. I tried 15 with him because Ashley Spencer can run 14. So I'm thinking, okay, this is a guy, this is a girl. He should be able to do at least 15 strides. And it just never worked. He worked so hard to get, um, and he's five, five, nine, but, um, so short for a pointer hurdler, but he also ran, um, 48, one, two. But again, we tried it. It used too much effort. So it's okay. You're going to run 16 strides and then you're going to, uh, and you're going to run 17 coming home. It's okay. So just don't get obsessed about the, the amount of steps and focus more on, uh, rhythm, stride rhythm making sure the rhythm is smooth, making sure the rhythm is effective. So the first six hurdles is going to be this really nice, smooth rhythm, kind of like how an 800 runner runs. It's just kind of cruising along. And then the intensity comes at hurdle six, and then you can start playing around with the, the, um, that rhythm. That rhythm is going to change. You know, it's almost like you're getting shot out of a cannon and you're going to pick your frequency up. And so maybe you end up taking extra steps. It's okay. So, um, Focus more on rhythm and focus more on uh, what the athlete is capable of doing. Don't try to force the athlete to do something that they can't do. And if you really want them to take less steps, if you're obsessed about it, then you got to get them faster and stronger. Because they have to be able to cover more ground easily. And the only way to do that is power. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. Any other questions? I can, I can talk about track stuff all day long, I tell you. <laughs> um, Tanya, could I ask a question? Yes. Um, you touched on it briefly there. Um, and they made you put on weight. And particularly, you know, with the young female athletes when they're transitioning, you know, obviously their body changes and everything and they can get very heavy periods. And if they're competing weekend, week out and they're bleeding heavily and it's a huge issue for them. How did you manage that? Or did you? That is such a great question. So um, my story was um, my mother had me when she was 19. I was her third child. Okay. Um, I got this athletic ability from my mother and father and they never played sports a day of their lives because they were having babies and, 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 um, and all that stuff. So they just never had the opportunity. I didn't realize until one day I was on a treadmill uh, next to my mother and she was hammering away and I was like, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's where I got it from, you know? So, um, so when I turned about 15, um, my mother to protect us was like, hey, you guys get on a bus, go down to Planned Parenthood and get birth control pills. So that's what we did, right? Um, my body totally changed. I went from like 98 pounds to 165 in about six months. Um, so it was, it totally changed what I was capable to, uh, of doing on the track. And because I did not know this, it took me years and years and years to figure out that I'm actually just not that big of a person. And I actually weigh less now than I, than I did then in some of my, um, what, 17, 18, 19 years old, I was pretty big. Um, and I didn't realize until I got to college that it was actually the birth control pills that was causing the trouble. Um, so now I have female athletes and um, there are some days that they show up that they are non-functional. I never had really terrible periods or anything like that. So it was actually hard for me to understand how, um, you know, almost to a point where I'm like, you've got to be joking me, right? Like in the corner, throwing up, acting like you can't get off the ground. I'm like, come on, there, there's no way that you're hurting that bad. Well, some people do, right? 
And so um, I actually had one athlete where I say, let me know the day that you're about to start your period, because I know that that is a day we're going to have to adjust. Okay. But I would rather adjust one or two days out of the month than to have them put on a birth control pill that is hormonal that's in their body every single day of the, the year. Right. So that is kind of another compromise that you have to make. And these young ladies have to figure there's a number of ways not to get pregnant, um, figure out one of them and make it work for you. But um, being on a birth control, a hormone, because that hormone that you're taking actually tells your body that you're pregnant. That's why you don't get pregnant. So I'm like, here you are trying to be this world-class athlete and you're walking around every day of the year pregnant. That's not gonna work either. <laughs> so that was what was going on with me and I didn't know it, okay? So um, like I said, these are tough conversations that you have to have, but they're real. So um, one thing that I have them do with the one that have really, really bad uh, periods is that um, they can take, so you have to be careful what you take because, you know, AIU and anti-doping, but um, uh, ibuprofen works um, and a day for you and the coach to understand that today is a tough day. Meaning maybe what I had written on the workout, we're not going to do today. Maybe you come out and you do a tempo and you get yourself together and we'll figure it out tomorrow. To me, that, that is much more valuable than um, them. Because the first thing they do when they go to the doctor, these doctors do not care nothing about you being an elite athlete. And it's the moment that you start telling them how tough of a period you're having or them being irregular or heavy, the first thing they offer you is birth control pills. That's just what they do because that's the easy way out, right? Um, I still have two this year that I was um, trying to have them understand what they're doing to their body. One just finally two weeks ago went off of it and I have one that is still has hormone that I cannot manage to get her to understand why it would be better for her not to do this. But at the same time, I can't, you know, control her life to that level she's gonna have to figure it out um but uh but that's that's what i would suggest i would just suggest having an open discussion about what other things you can do to manage it because that is the one thing that i found out that helps the best is if they understand that you're understanding on what's coming because it's going to come every month and how to manage it and how to work it around training, just like you would manage, or just so you have to work anything around training. I think that's one thing that you have to work around training because certain people really struggle where it's, it's usually one day. I, I don't, I haven't had an athlete at all that has struggled more than one day. And it's usually the day before the period or the first day of the period. And then, I mean, heavy bleeding, I don't care about that. That's, that's not going to, that's heat neither here nor there, but it usually is the cramping and the pain, the nausea and the fatigue that will come either the day before the period or the day of the, the first day of the period. And so that's only one day. I can, I can work with you for one day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, any final questions? Yeah, Daniel. Um... Hi, Tanya. Thanks for everything. Um, could I just follow on from what Noelle was saying there? Um, some of the sort of theory out there in relation to women and periods is that back in the sort of day, the primitive hour and onwards, women had less than 12 periods per year because they were basically having babies and throughout their uh, fertile life, they were having less periods and therefore their bodies were less taxed over those few years. And it seems that if there is athletes that do have a, a heavier cycle, as in there are days that could amount up to between seven and 10, where there's fluctuations in a buildup, and then it's usually not when the period comes, it's usually the buildup. And like, mm -hmm. I've, yeah, so in that, that might have a seven to ten the cumulative effect of all of that sort of irregularity in their mentality and their bodies is quite draining so sometimes then the idea and the solution is that you go towards something that can regulate that and it's quite a conflicting thing for a young girl to try or as a coach of someone to try find out what's best for them 
and even throughout a few years you can try a lot of those things but it's still uh, demanding on the body cumulatively with all the training and the demands and then trying to plan competition so it's 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 curious to me as to how to best get that balance with with a young girl a young woman you know what I would try though too if it if it comes to a point where you're dealing with it um that's a whole week out of a month that's a lot of time mm. um everybody's body manages in its own way according to how your hormones function so there are supplements that you can take that will help with hormones um that will they're natural so it's not anything that is um illegal or anything like that. It's kind of like if you're going through menopause, right? There are supplements out there that you can take that help with menopause and it's still just hormone, right? So um, black cohosh is one of them and it just helps to regulate your menstrual cycle and it's not illegal. It's totally natural. You can take it and take a drug test all day long if you want to and it, it, it won't do anything to you. So those are th some things you can do too. And if you take in that every single day, then it really helps to, to, um, to manage your, um, your uh, menstrual cycles and your, and your female hormone levels. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's something worth a try, you know, mm -hmm. because there are a lot, there are things out there that will help. They will uh, make your uh, periods not as tough on you and you, you won't bleed as heavily and um, then there's, a, you know, uh, mood swings that come along with it, too. <laughs> that, uh, that, it, that there are supplements that will help with all of that. <laughs> you just got to yeah. figure it out. But that was another part we mm -hmm. talked about, too. And I, I had one girl um, go see a, um, a specialist uh, that uh, deals with hormones. And it turns out, and this girl's an elite athlete, um, turns out she had... Um, low what was it uh it wasn't estrogen or testosterone one of the other hormones but um and they actually put her on some hormone medication too that is not illegal but it actually helped mm -hmm. her and then her peer all her period cramps and everything went away and she got but um but it was this panel she paid like probably five hundred dollars to do this panel to measure to test all all of her different hormones because we knew that it turned out it was a hormone problem and guess what she was had a whole bunch of extra weight on her but i'm going to tell you all this and i know i got guys on the phone on the line but let me tell you what threw her hormones off have you ever heard of the plan b okay she was using plan b and that's something where um it's a pill that you can take that forces you to have a period um it's a form of birth control uh, it's not good for you <laughs> but it's right over the counter you can get it anywhere and so when you're talking about these female athletes you have to I mean you can't just be putting anything in your body okay and I actually had to uh tell our nutritionist at USA track and field that works in nutritionist I said hey let me let you know this is out there because I don't think, you know, when you're just talking about the, horn, the uh, birth control pills that you take once a day, you're not, you don't understand that there's other birth controls out there that is hormones that athletes could be putting in their bodies and, and you don't know how to address it if you don't know what's happening. But um, yeah, so, so sometimes they can... Like doing anything wrong. Thank you. I know right the guy, why do we have to deal with this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why do we have to deal with we, this? Hey, we we, we got to shave every day, you know? Yeah, right? See? Yeah, yeah. I don't have to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, um, we, might, we might leave it there. I know uh, Tanya has to hit the road. Um, eight now, eight hour drive to her competition uh, venue. So um, just want to thank. Tanya, first and foremost, and thank you all for taking part and for the open discussions at, at the end and uh, questions we'll, and answers we'll all learn from. So thanks, everybody. Um, just to let you know, the, the guys that are, are on the mentoring program, the selected coaches, have access to Tanya for the remainder of January, February and March. So please, please use that um, 
Thanks a million, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Tanya. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Okay. Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Think of some Bye. questions and you want to shoot me a quick email, just email me and I'll shoot you something back, okay? Super. Thanks again. Thank Thanks for the Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks folks. Bye. Bye.